Um, I want to begin today by asking you if you have a Bible to open it up to Malachi chapter 4. Use the table of contents if necessary. If you do not have a Bible, there's an object lesson here. So I need you to take what Bible from under your chair and open up to Malachi chapter 4. That would be on page 803, I believe. Yes, 803 in your Bibles uh, under the chairs. Malachi chapter 4. These are the last words of the Old Testament. Chapter 4, verse 5. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord comes. And he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearers of children or the hearts of children to their fathers, lest I come and strike the land with a decree of utter destruction. And now here's the object lesson. I want you to turn that page. And in the Bibles in your chairs, what's on the next page? No? What's on the very next page? Nothing. Nothing is on the next page. Now, what's the object lesson? That's about what God said for a period of 400 years. From the end of Malachi, the last written prophet we have in the Old Testament, sometime between 445 B.C. and 420 B.C., and what we're going to talk about today in the coming of the New Testament, the New Covenant, and the coming of Christ, God was silent. God didn't say anything. And what we're going to see today is that God, when he does come, comes at unexpected time. Like, there's no reason to expect him to show up when he shows up. God works unexpected time, and God works through unexpected people when he comes back in and begins working personally with these people, uh, and the plans he unfolds are really unexpected. All that to say, we're going to see today that God is really unexpected. You can expect the unexpected from God. And so what was happening during that blank page? Because I think that's important as we think about our passage today. What was happening during those 400 years? In the words of King George, Oceans rise, empires fall, so something like that. Hamilton, raise your hand if you heard Hamilton's soundtrack. Okay, that fell flat. Here, okay. <laughs> Hopefully third service, more haven people are in there. Here's what happens. Alexander the Great, let's try this. How many of you have heard of Alexander the Great? Okay, good. Alexander the Great takes Jerusalem in his Macedonian campaign in about 332 BC. So God has been silent. It's been about 100 years. And there's a transition of governments from the Persians to the Greeks. Now, here's what I want you to think about. If you're familiar with the Old Testament and the history of God's people, you know that when empires change, God is involved. So you know that when it went from Assyria to Babylon, God was involved in that. The Old Testament talks about it. When it went from Babylon to Persia, God was involved with that. The Old Testament talks about that. The book of Daniel looks to a time in the future when some of these things are going to unfold, but God's not doing it, or at least it appears that he's not doing it. And so you have Alexander the Great that comes on, no mention of this, and then you have the Ptolemaic kingdom, which kind of rises up from the south, and they take over that area uh, where Jerusalem is in 320. And then in 200... The Seleucid Empire, ouch. Other than the Holocaust, literally, this is probably the worst time to be a Jew. It was unbelievable. And you've heard us talk about this if you've been around OCF for a while, but as an example, people who are trying to live according to God's Torah, trying to live according to what God had said, this is how you live, his instructions. Uh, People were not just being killed for it, they were being brutally killed for it. Uh, women who were observing the Sabbath had babies cut out of their wombs and hung around their necks and put on display for people to see, you don't do this. They defiled the temple courts by building an altar to their gods, where God, Yahweh, Israel's God, was supposed to be worshipped. It was just a brutal time in Israel's history, and God remained silent. And then the Maccabean Revolt, you may have heard of this. This is... Uh, 
between 167 and 160, uh, there's about a one to two year period where they actually gained control of Jerusalem. These are Jewish people. Uh, and so they get it, but they're still not really, they, they're fighting for God. They're fighting for the Torah. They're, they think they're fighting on behalf of Yahweh and his people, but God is silent during this period. And then in 140, you get the Hasmonean uh, kingdom that comes in and they kind of take over, but they're pretty sympathetic to the Jews, at least a lot more so than the Seleucid Empire. And then in 63, you've heard of Rome, yes? This was before the real Roman Empire, but the empire was beginning to emerge, and so you had the Roman Republic under Pompey the Great, and he, uh, the Romans, what was kind of great about their uh, conquership is that when they conquered, they would let the local rulers lead. And so what they end up doing is appointing Herod, king of the Jews. Yes, the same Herod that we read about in the New Testament. But God is still quiet during all this. There's no reason why God didn't break in and say something in 332 BC, or why God didn't say something in 40 BC, or why he didn't say something in 17 BC. But what we see is for some reason, whether it's 6 BC or 5 BC or 4 BC, sometime during that period, he does speak. And that's where we pick up the story today. Herod expands the Temple Mount, rebuilds the Temple. Whoops, forgot about that. And then John the Baptist is born. And this is when God's unexpected timing happens. This is when God breaks in for the first time in a long time, and the silence is broken unexpectedly. And so what we're going to see today is that God breaks in unexpectedly. God's timing is unexpected. The people God uses for his plans are unexpected and his plans are unexpected. Nobody expected what's going to happen and how it would happen. So now flip ahead a few pages. Uh, if you turn one page, you get Matthew, but that's not where we're at. We've been studying Luke, and so we're going to look at Luke's account of the Christmas stories. Luke chapter 1, it's on page 855 in those Bibles. So God's timing was unexpected. Now let's look at the people God uses and how unexpected it is. Pick it up in Luke chapter 1, verse 5. In the days of Herod, king of Judea, there was a priest named Zechariah of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous before God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and statutes of the Lord. But they had no child because Elizabeth was barren, and both were advanced in years. Nothing out of the ordinary. Just two people living in this area. Zechariah is a priest. There were roughly 18,000 priests. So nothing unique about that. Elizabeth is like less than ordinary. She can't have children. And if you're familiar with Old Testament stories, New Testament stories, you know this was a real marginalizing thing in the life of a woman during this time period. And so you have two people that nothing extraordinary, just faithfully living according to Torah, living according to the instructions God has laid out for them. And it's at this time and through these people that God is going to break in. But listen again to the ordinary nature of these people. Verse 8. Now, while he was serving as priest before God, when his division was on duty, according to the custom of the priesthood, he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord and burn incense. And the whole multitude of the people were praying outside at the hour of incense. Again, there's nothing really significant about this. He's one of 18,000, roughly. And what would happen is all those priests were on duty at the temple for two weeks every year. And the two weeks weren't consecutive, so they would be on this week, and they'd do their duty, and then they'd be on another week, and that would be their service for the year. Now, there were some different stages of, like, this is what a priest get to do. Some people were cleaners. Some people got to offer sacrifices. Some people cleaned up the sacrifices after. Some people did the cooking. I mean, it's just all sorts of priestly activities that happen. And just to give you kind of some bearings on this, this is a Herod's Temple, uh, to give you a little context of size, that's an American football field, that rectangle. This is the rectangle of the Temple Mountain. So you can see it's 
you know, close to three football fields if you were to put them, uh, fit three of those into that bigger rectangle. And this is uh, what Herod rebuilt. Out here is where the Gentiles could go. In here is where women could go, and then the men could get closer. The priests could get yet closer. And so when a priest was offering the sacrifices, that's where he was. You can kind of blow it up a little bit here. This is where John the Baptist would be doing his ministry. And so what would happen is this number of priests, whoever it was that were on duty, they would roll the dice or cast lots, and your lot came up. This is what you did. And so for Zechariah, it happens to be the one time in his lifetime when he'll be able to go past the court here and actually enter into the temple, and right there's the incense and where the altar of incense is. And so this is the one, again, it's not, it's not like this is a supernatural event. This happened every day, twice a day. They offered morning sacrifices and evening sacrifices. John the Baptist is simply doing what priests did. He's nothing special. And yet it's through this normal, ordinary person that God unexpectedly does something wonderful. Let's pick up the rest of the story. You'll see really how regular a guy he was. Verse 11. And there appeared to him an angel of the Lord standing on the right side of the altar of incense. And Zechariah was troubled when he saw him, and fear fell upon him. It's kind of a common occurrence when people run into God or his messengers. Fear wells up, and the angel says to him, Do not be afraid, Zechariah, for your prayer has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son, and you shall call his name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great before the Lord, and he must not drink wine or strong drink, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit, even from his mother's womb, and he will turn many of the children of Israel to the Lord their God. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just to make ready for the Lord a people prepared. Now you can turn back if you want, but let me read back in Malachi the last words of the Old Testament. Let, look, at, look at chapter 1, verse 17 again. And he will go before him in the spirit and power of Elijah to turn the hearts of the fathers to the children and the disobedient to the wisdom of the just. Now go back to Malachi chapter 4, last words of the Old Testament. Behold, I will send you Elijah the prophet before the great and awesome day of the Lord, and he will turn the hearts of the fathers to their children and the hearts of the children to their fathers. God has broken the silence. And John the Baptist, or John, not John, Zechariah is the guy. And Zechariah, this is where we see how ordinary he really was. He doesn't respond with the, awesome, let's do this, God. Look what he says in verse 18. And Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know this? For I am an old man and my wife is advanced in years. And the angel answered him, I am Gabriel, I stand in the presence of God, and I was sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. I need a sign, Zechariah says. I'm, I'm old, my wife's old, we're kind of past that age. We've just been going about our life. Are you, are you sure you got the right guy? I need a sign. And just in keeping with God's wonderful sense of humor, he says, here's your sign. You're not going to be able to talk anymore. Look at verse 20. And behold, you will be silent and unable to speak until the day that these things take place because you did not believe my words which will be fulfilled in their time. And the people were waiting for Zechariah, and they were wondering at his delay in the temple. And when he came out and he was unable to speak to them, and they realized that he had seen a vision in the temple, and he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And when his time of service was ended, he went to his home. And after these days, his wife Elizabeth conceived, and for five months she kept herself hidden, saying, Thus the Lord has done for me in the days when he looked on me to take away my reproach among people. At an unexpected time, God breaks in and breaks the silence. Through unexpected people, a normal priest and a barren wife who are older in age, past the childbearing age, and God breaks in and now he's going to work his plans through these two. And what we see is this plan that he has is really unexpected. It's not what you would imagine. Now, Luke doesn't tell us 
the rest of Zechariah and Elizabeth's story next. For some reason, he thinks it's important to talk about this guy named Jesus before uh, that. That was said in sarcasm. Jesus is really important. But if you skip ahead to verse 57, you see now the birth of John the Baptist. This is God's plan through these people in this family. Now the time came for Elizabeth to give birth, and she bore a son. And her neighbors and relatives heard that the Lord had shown great mercy to her, and they rejoiced with her. And on the eighth day, they came to circumcise the child, and they would have called him Zechariah after his father, but his mother answered, no, he shall be called John. Unexpected. And they said to her, none of your relatives is called by this name. And they made signs to his father, inquiring what he wanted him to be called. And he asked for a writing tablet and wrote, his name is John. And they all wonder. It's like, that's unexpected. Why would his name be John? Well, if you look back in the end of verse 59 or verse 58, and the Lord had shown great mercy to her. And a little bit later, when Zechariah prophesies about the future, he talks about God's great mercy. John, in Hebrew, means the Lord is gracious or merciful. So there's something significant to this unexpected name. In in that world, you named your son Zechariah, or you named your son something that was a family name. But not this family. You're going to name him John. There's something significant about that. And so they name him John, and everybody's like, well, what's going on? Why would you name him John? Verse 64, unexpectedly and immediately his mouth was opened and his tongue was loosed, and he spoke, blessing God. And fear came on all their neighbors, and all these things were talked about through all the hill country of Judea. Aslan is on the move. And all who heard them laid them up in their hearts, saying, when, when, or What then will this child be? For the hand of the Lord was with him. Clearly, God has broken at an unexpected time, and God is working through this ordinary, unexpected family. What is God doing? What's he going to do? What is this plan for this child? And this is what we see in Zechariah's prophecy. He says, this is what's happening. What's happening is God is inaugurating his kingdom, a Messiah is going to come, and my son's going to be the one who's telling them about it. Verse 67, and his father Zechariah was filled with the Holy Spirit and prophesied, saying, blessed be the Lord God of Israel, for he has visited and redeemed his people and has raised up a horn of salvation for us in the house of his servant David as he spoke by the mouth of his holy prophets from of old that we should be saved from our enemies and from the hand of all who hate us to show the mercy promised to our fathers and to remember his holy covenant, the oath that he swore to our father Abraham to grant us that we being delivered from the hand of our enemies might serve him without fear in holiness and righteousness before him all our days. The only time in the gospels other than when Jesus celebrates communion with his disciples in the upper room And in that scene, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, he says, this is the blood of my, the new covenant. But other than that, the only other time the word covenant is used in the Gospels is right here in Zechariah's prophecy. And he says, this child is the fulfillment of a promise God made to Abraham, how long ago? Like 2,000 years before. 2,000 years ago, God entered into a covenant relationship with Abraham And now, unexpectedly, it's coming to fruition. God promised to bless Abraham and through him to bless all the families on earth. That's what Jesus is coming to do. And the guy who's making the way, the guy who's opening the door so that Jesus can walk through is Zechariah's son, John the Baptist. And Zechariah sees this. God is speaking through him, through this ordinary priest, an ordinary woman who is barren and past childbearing age, God helps her conceive. And now God's plans are beginning to come clear. I've broken in at an unexpected time, and through these unexpected people, I'm going to bring salvation to the world. There's a salvation for the Jews in one sense. They're expecting something a little different than what happens. What Jesus ends up doing is unexpected. But what John the Baptist is going to do, and this is the birth here, and this is 
uh, why I think it's so appropriate on this Sunday that we celebrate hope. Verse 76, And you, child, will be called the prophet of the Most High, for you will go before the Lord to prepare his ways, to give knowledge of salvation to his people and the forgiveness of their sins because of the tender mercy of our God, whereby the sunrise shall visit us from on high to give light to those who sit in darkness and in the shadow of death to guide our feet into the way of peace. This word from the Lord to an unexpected man is salvation is coming. And my son is going to grow up and he's going to proclaim that. He's going to make the way straight. He's going to prepare the path for the Messiah to walk through. And in God's great mercy, it's a message of forgiveness. A message of forgiveness for the sins we've committed. Now, what's the point of telling the story this way? What's the point of Luke structuring it the way he does and telling us about John the Baptist and then cutting over to Jesus and Joseph and Mary, you know, like a movie that tells us this story, then it goes to this story, then it goes back to that story, is I think what he's doing is he's, he's telling us that because God works unexpectedly and because God works through unexpected people, there's always hope that God can act. We don't know when he's going to act. We don't know through whom he's going to act. But we know because he's always acted unexpectedly with regard to time and unexpectedly with regard to people, we can expect to be hopeful because he will act. And I think we've seen this in our lives. We've seen the unexpected ways that God steps in and the unexpected people that he uses. Let me just give you a couple stories. I grew up, many of you know, uh, my grandfather was a pastor. And grew up at a church, and you know, you had the church property, and my grandfather and grandmother lived in a parsonage. Now, if you grew up in church, you know what a parsonage is. It's the pastor's house that, like, if this was our church building growing up, the parking lot, the other side of the parking lot was where the house was. Now, the commute is great, <laughs> but that's about the only blessing of living that close to the church that I can figure. But Across the street from my grandparents' house was that neighbor. Like, we have one of those neighbors on OCA, on Coral Circle here. But it's that neighbor, for whatever reason, they've got a vendetta against God, and they're taking it out on you. And so this, these neighbors were just a thorn in the side of my grandfather. Like, my grandmother is the most saintly woman. I, I literally, I don't think I ever heard her say a bad thing about anybody except this neighbor. <laughs> like, it was that kind of a neighbor. And my grandfather passed away when I was a freshman in high school. And about a year later, we got another pastor who came. And he was uh, there all the way through my high school and college years, actually, until I came to OCF. He was still there. And he was from Texas. It was like a fresh start. He didn't know the relationship of this neighbor to you know the church and to the people. And so he tried to, you know, just, you know, high neighbor kind of stuff, but it kind of fell flat. But then one day, uh, this guy got sick. He was older at the time, I guess late 50s, early 60s. And it was a serious sickness. I don't think it was septic, but it was, it was like that. And so it was real tenuous. And Pastor Jerry, uh, one of the adult children, said something when he said, you know, hi, he said, you know, I'm not a pray, praying guy, but I'd appreciate if you pray for my dad. It's real touch and go. And so Jerry said, well, yeah, of course I'll be praying for him. And so then Jerry followed up when he got back from the hospital, and this guy becomes a Christian. Now, talk about unexpected. Like, I about fell over in my seat when I drive up and I see Jerry talking with this guy, and then that guy shows up at church. And I'm like, are you kidding me? Like, what happened? Unexpected timing, unexpected people, and it's like, man. And by the way, this guy was really involved with local politics. Like, I would say he was power hungry, kind of a thing, you know, like that little league president that rubs everybody the wrong way. <laughs> this was that guy. But guess what that guy began to do for the church whenever they would have to deal with the city? He became our advocate. Like, unexpected timing, unexpected people, 
we're now advocating for our church when we had to do a building project or you had to get a permit or anything like that. I was like, wow, that's how God works. We've seen it at OCF. As elders, we sit around that table and grieve marriages that are just broken. And we see as we talk with the wife or you talk with the husband how, I mean, these are cement hearts that are not just like solid cement, they're also crumbling. And so it's a hard heart that's broken, and you're like, there is no way that this is going to be healed. And then all of a sudden, one of them humbles themselves, asks forgiveness, opens the door for reconciliation, and they're back together. And I got to tell you, we've been surprised on a few. Unexpected that God would bring healing to that relationship. But that's what God does. The story that I hope and I try to be intentional about telling it every year about God doing something unintentional or unexpected in the life of our church is this building we sit in. So if you'll indulge me, those of you who have been here the last few years. But actually, this month will be 12 years in this building. Now, here's the backstory. We were renting a place, leasing a place on Rosecrans at Continental Park. And when we got into that building, it was a really... Uh, good deal. The market was really depressed in this area. There were a ton of vacancies, and so we got a screaming deal to move into that place. And I don't remember the exact number. Uh, I thought it was 55 cents a square foot when we first moved in, and then it went up 10 cents a square foot every year. Uh, But when we were there, we were paying in our last year there $21,000 a month just on rent. And what we realized was as we looked at our budget for the last five years, over 100% of our budget increase for that five-year period was building costs. And we weren't getting any more space. I mean, it was just, it just was going up because the lease, the market was hot, uh, and we had no leverage to negotiate. And so we didn't know what we were going to do. We were financially struggling at the time as well as a church. And so I thought it'd be a good idea to get some of our business guys at the church because I'm not a business guy. And so I wanted to get these guys together and just brainstorm what can we do here. Maybe there's a strategy to go try and renegotiate this lease uh, so we can just figure out how to make ends meet going forward. And so I had uh, these guys. It was tough to get them all together because their travel schedules and that. So I finally settled on, well, let's just get together on a Sunday morning uh, when I'm not preaching and we can meet during one of the services. And so we have this meeting set up for a few weeks out. I see Jerry was a part of that meeting. Jim Lenan was a part of that meeting. And Jim, what happened on the Friday before that meeting? Unexpected. Jim gets a call from somebody who used to go to OCF, says, hey, you know, my partner and I have this building near the church. Just wondered if you guys might be interested in leasing it. And Jim said, well, why don't you give Brandon a call? And so he calls me and says, hey, we got this building. My partner and I bought it thinking we would move our business into it but it's not going to work out timing-wise and just thought maybe the church might want to lease it. And I said, well, to be honest, we're, we're trying to get out of a lease. Um, we don't know what we're going to do, but we're thinking maybe we can move out, cut down our costs, and try and save some money to buy eventually. And he said, well, we'd be open to sell. And I said, what are you doing Sunday morning? <laughs> and so he comes to that meeting on Sunday morning, comes in, tells us uh, what the you know, just about the building, where they were at, what they paid for it, and said, you know, we'll sell it to you for that. Jerry was great. He was like, well, did you give him the would you take kind of? (laughs) But anyway, so we have this meeting, and he gets up and walks out, and somebody at the table, I can't remember who it was, said, well, I think God just answered our question. And so what was so interesting about that particular time, too, it was the market was completely different than when we moved into the place on Rosecrans. This building, had it hit the market, it would have been a bidding war with cash offers right away. So we get the opportunity to buy a building with no competition. Now we just had to work with the city of El Segundo. Well, they were willing to go as long as we want, but then the people who were here, who were leasing the place, were moving out. And it took us like about 18 months to get through this process with the city to turn a warehouse with 32 parking spots into a church. And so it was just a long process. Well, the tenants move out, and so they're not going to pay for their mortgage on the building. If we wanted to hold it in escrow, then we had to pay for the mortgage. So now we're paying somewhere around $15,000 a month for this and $21,000 a month for the building over there. We just can't do that. Like, financially, we can't do that. And so I call Continental, and I'm like, is there any way we could get out of our lease? 
is here's the situation we're trying to buy it's not going fast we've got um, you know some financial issues to bridge this thing is there any way you would let us out of our lease question on their end was well why would why would you need to get out of your lease and they said well can you find anything cheaper and I was like yeah we can rent at a school maybe for like a thousand dollars a weekend uh, and we can just move our offices and you know go work from home and really cut down our costs and uh, the assistant of the owner and president of Continental said, well, let me get back to you, Brandon. Richard wants to think about it. Now, remember, we had tried to renegotiate a lease before and got nothing. And Carol, his assistant, even said, Brandon, you know, this, <laughs> this doesn't happen. And she gave me some reasons about when they uh, refinance buildings and leverage it to build other stuff. They have leases that are signed uh, from their tenants that show their good faith to their lenders all that stuff that I didn't understand. And uh, so Friday afternoon comes. I'm walking Abigail home, my oldest, who was in kindergarten or first grade at the time. Now she's a sophomore in college. And we're walking home, and uh, my phone rings. I pull out that flip phone. <laughs> <laughs> it's Continental Development. Carol on the other end. She says, hey, Brandon, uh, Richard's been thinking about it this week, and here's what he proposes. He says, you can keep all of your square footage, including the office space, and we'll give it to you for $4,000 a month for as long as you need it. Talk about an unexpected. It's the only time in 20 years at OCF that I changed my sermon between Friday and Sunday. <laughs> <laughs> it was unexpected. Unexpected timing, the whole thing. Unexpected people that God was working through, and the way it's carried out, it's just been awesome. And now, I, don't, I, just, I didn't do this first service, but I thought of it. If you look at the back of your notes, a little over a $5 million project, $5.5 million project, and we're $200,000 away from paying it off. And you just see how God has worked in this. I'm sure if you guys thought hard about your lives, you could see God working in unexpected timing and unexpected people and for unexpected plans. And the more you expect God to act in unexpected ways, the more hope you'll have. You'll hope and you'll know that whether he acts tomorrow or next week or months from now or years from now, he will act. It's what he does. That's the hope we have. Let's pray.